Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. The program is about to begin. At this time, please turn off all electronic devices. Please refrain from using flash photography during the program. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Giano Caldwell. Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for coming this evening. For those of you that I've not met, my name is Joanne Drake, and I currently serve as the Chief Administrative Officer for the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute. In honor of our men and women who wear the uniform of this country and serve overseas and within the states, we ask that you please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please be seated. Before we get started this evening with our guest, I would like to uh, point out and acknowledge a couple of special guests that have come with our author this evening. A couple of them, you're going to know their names. If you haven't read the book, you will get to know their names. If you have read the book, you already know them. Uh, the first one is Gianno's godmother, Barbara Fraser, here from Chicago. Welcome. The second one is a gentleman that you will see it throughout the book, Benjamin Hodges. And the third one is someone that I know only by Aunt Patricia. Patricia Burns, Gianna's aunt. Tonight we will hear from a young man who was born and raised on the south side of Chicago. He lived in the projects, in a life influenced and heavily affected by gangs and drugs. His mother was an addict dependent on opioids, which forced his grandparents to step in to help raise him, along with eight brothers and sisters. Growing up, even his deeply religious grandmother bleakly told him that he would not amount to much. In his book, Giano tells us that, to her and others, my future was already cast. The poverty made it so. My parents, my schooling, my block, the color of my skin. This is why I feel for individuals who find themselves surrounded by loved ones who don't think they can do better than those who came before them. Yet at 14 years old, Giano took on his first formal job and his first step into a new life when he went to work for his local alderman, a Democrat, by the way. He turned that into a job with the federal government by the time he was 16 years old. I believe at the Social Security Administration. He has been a congressional intern, a government relations director for a local township, and served as the legislative liaison to the Illinois State Treasurer. He worked for the Illinois Republican Party, and then he helped to advance the presidential campaign for Mitt Romney. Currently, Giano is a television host. He's a lobbyist, event speaker, and political analyst on the Fox News Channel. He is also the founder of a bipartisan firm in Washington, D.C. that provides strategic advice and consulting in the area of public affairs, which also makes him a businessman and entrepreneur. He is the recipient of both the 2016 Porsche Power and Red Alert Politics 30 Under 30 Awards. And in his spare time, he covers red carpet events for Extra TV. Oh, yes, and now he is a full-fledged author. You might say that Giano Caldwell has had a full life already, 
yet he's barely old enough to really write a book about his life. <laughs> and in this book, taken for granted, how conservatism can win back the Americans that liberalism failed, Giano tells the story of his childhood journey on streets filled with violence, poverty, and drugs. But instead of giving in to that environment with its generations of drug and government dependency, Giano dug deep into his personal foundation of faith, family, hard work, and often just sheer determination. He says that he wrote this book to answer the two questions he's most often asked. One, how, considering your start, did you achieve what you have? And two, how and why the heck are you a black conservative? <laughs> Tonight, I think we're going to find out who was taken for granted, who did liberalism fail, and exactly how conservatism can win them back. We'll hear Giano's views on this country's preconceived notions, some of which are historically inaccurate, I might add, about what makes a Democrat or a Republican. Giano is coming at this from a deeply personal perspective, but with that he brings a great discussion and a lot of practical ideas about how to approach education, crime, and changing the status quo in this country. Giano's book is getting great reviews. Five stars on Amazon with comments, yes. I've seen comments like, remarkably inspiring, a gripping page turner, a must read for all Americans seeking to better their lives. And three days ago, in a tweet from President Trump, I believe he was on board Air Force One, he called Giano a young winner. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Gianno Caldwell to our stage. Well, Gianno, we're thrilled to have you. And um, as you can see, I've <laughs> noted a few pages in my own book. I'm guessing that many of you will do the same after you get one tonight. If you don't already have one, I really encourage you to read it. It was, um, it was an easy read intellectually, but a difficult read emotionally. Oh, wow. So um, a, little, a little bit of everything in the book. And in it, I just want to start with, you wrote, I rose out of poverty and I reached professional heights that few people thought possible, including myself. But I too am not exceptional or special. Yeah. I'm certainly not the first kid to make it out of the projects, nor am I the first black conservative you ever saw on TV. I am not the first person on earth to achieve more than what was expected of him. Many, in fact, work to overcome even greater obstructions of health or upbringing or financial ruin than me. My desire is not to compete with those who've had it worse or better, but only to expose the terrible lie of limitations and share the values that made the next steps possible for me. Without giving away everything in the book, can you give us a synopsis of your story and why you wanted to write a book? Well, first and foremost, thank y'all for coming. Give yourselves a hand. <laughs> Thank y'all. And um, as you were reading that bio, I was wondering, who is this person? I want to meet this guy. It was <laughs> it's pretty amazing. No, I thank you for that. And truthfully speaking, when we talk about limitations and people putting their own expectations on you of what they believe is possible for you and beating beyond the, the doubts of others, especially those that may be the closest to you. You specifically mentioned my grandmother, which was a heartbreaking time for me. It's kind of emotional, but it was heartbreaking to have my grandmother tell me that I wouldn't be successful. Mm -hmm. It really was. But here's the thing. When considering who we are as individuals, it's more important than ever not to operate in fear. And that's why when I signed my book, I put in 2 Timothy 1 and 7, for God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind. Because oftentimes, more than anything else, the people that you can see around you who are shedding their doubts onto you are operating in a fear-based reality. Mm -hmm. And for me, it took 
a special someone that came into my life who happened to be a family member, my grandfather. He was my first ever mentor. He was the individual who told me when the teacher said that I wasn't smart or I couldn't accomplish something or maybe my grandmother made a comment, he told me that I could. He said, you absolutely could. Don't believe that, don't buy into that. And I think that's what's a part of uh, an issue that a lot of people have when they're not willing to go and ask for help or get a mentor or just talk to someone who may believe in their talent. Mm -hmm. So for me, having someone that I could speak to, someone who believed in my talent, who believed that I can be greater than what other people said, um, and then certainly accessing the power of faith, which we'll get to, that made all the difference in my life. And that's what continues to make a difference in my life today. Speaking of your grandfather, I know that you have a special story in the book, sort of a changing moment in your life um, on a day when you were helping him. That may have been your first job, actually, right? <laughs> yeah, it was. Not your alderman's job, but <laughs> right. your plumbing job, right. right? Everybody should learn how to do plumbing, by the way. <laughs> you can make a heck of a lot more money than doing anything else. <laughs> um, tell us a little bit about. So my mom and dad were never married, but I was blessed to see my grandparents every Friday. My granddad would pick me up, my, my dad rather, would take me to my grandparents' house and we would have catfish and spaghetti. If anybody knows about that, that's a Chicago thing. I see somebody here that knows about the catfish and spaghetti. We watched TGI of Fridays, if y'all remember, Family Matters and a lot of those shows. And on Saturdays, my grandfather would wake me up very early, 7 a.m., and he would take me to work with him. He would pay me $10 a day to hold the flashlight, hand tools, and he wanted me to see how money was earned. He would keep a wad of cash in his pocket, but he would take me to the bank where he would cash the check and show me from step one, I went and did this job, I got a check for it, and this is the result. Mm -hmm. So on one particular day, we were riding through an area of Chicago called Inglewood. This is one of the hardest hit areas in terms of the drugs and violence. And as we're, as we're riding, I see a lady who um, appears beat down and drugged up. And it began to bring tears to my eyes. And my grandfather sees it, and in his very southern voice, he says to me, what's wrong with you, boy? <laughs> and at that point, I realized it wasn't my mother. It certainly could have been. I said to him, this lady, what can I do to prevent this from happening? And he begins to tell me about the elected officials and the power they have to create change in the form of policy. They can provide greater penalties for those who sell and distribute drugs, how they can provide grant funding for those who want to be rehabilitated. And I said, I want to be an elected official. Now, I have no interest in running now, <laughs> but back then, certainly that was my interest. So the very next week, I started volunteering for my local alderman, and I was there every day after school like it was a job. And it didn't hit me until years ago, like literally probably three, four years ago, that the reason I did it is because I literally thought I was saving my mother. So that's what got me into politics at the age of 14. That's great, good story. Yeah. Thank you. So I guess I do have a question in here that someone has asked, when will you be running for office? So I guess we can get rid of that one. We already just got the answer on that one. But I wanna go back to your grandfather in the sense that you talk about him in the book, throughout the book, yeah. and, and about others as being mentors. Yes. I guess I want to hear a little bit more about who those mentors are in your life, why mentors are an important part of your story, and they're important really for all of us as we grow up. But also I want to know, have you mentored anyone yet? Oh, absolutely. I mentor a lot of people right now. I think that's important, incredibly important to give back because somebody planted a seed in me. The seed has been watered and it's increasing and I should be doing the same. I think that's incredibly important to there's so many people here, I'm sure y'all talk to young people all the time, you invest in their life, you give them a positive word, that means a great deal to have someone who's accomplished as much as a lot of you all have in this audience, um, to have someone to say, hey, I think you can do it. I think you can be exceptional, as I like to reject that term per personally, but you can be great. You can be the greatest this, that, or the other, and that means so much to a person, mm -hmm. to have especially a young person, but even an adult, to have someone that believes in them. A lot of people are hungry. They're hungry for someone to believe in their skill, their talent, their personality, because 
if you look at social media, and I'm sure some of y'all may not be on social media, maybe you are, and if you are, at Gianno Caldwell, where is it? Should be here somewhere. <laughs> Twitter, Instagram, and uh, Facebook. But uh, you see so much negativity on social media. Mm -hmm. It seems like it, it's an ecosystem for a lot of people that's used to beat people down, beat them up, mm -hmm. speak negative, not build people up. And that's one of the elements I think a mentor, having a, a really strong mentor in your life, can beat back those, those perceptions that negative pe people may have uh, against you. So for me, right now, my mentor is Pastor Dr. Will, Bill Winston. If anybody know Dr. Bill Winston, anybody? Dr. Bill Winston? Okay, you know Dr. Bill Winston? He's, uh, he's my pastor back home, 20,000 member church, but this was the first individual, I think, who on a regular, consistent basis every week, you're not a victim. Just telling the whole church, you're not a victim. You don't need the government to take care of you. God is gonna take care of you. Just plant those seeds. So important, so important. Just breaking these preconceived notions that so many people have that I have to be, I have to live in this fear-based mentality or be a victim. No, you don't, be the victor. That's so important, be the victor. Absolutely be the victor. 100% agree with you. I think that there are a lot of people, a lot of young people, but generations of young people that growing up feel that way, um, that they're happier being the victim. And finally, when somebody takes an interest in them and makes them believe that they can be the victor. And, and that makes a huge difference. One person. It so. only takes one person, but I continue to reach out and ask um, for help if I need it. I'll. Uh, if it's somebody that may be on television that I'm interested in meeting, I'll DM, on, DM, them, DM them I'm sorry, on Instagram. And mentorship is a lifelong commitment. Mm -hmm. You continue to seek out guidance. You continue to mentor others. Um, interestingly enough, I, I met a, a young person just yesterday who was two years old, who I, if y'all seen on, on Twitter, I posted a picture, a young little guy who just got adopted. And... I needed to take that moment, he was dressed up, and just say hello and encourage him, although he may not know what's going on and his parents were, were there, but that's something that could be helpful. Just plant the seeds in the youth, no matter how old they are. It's a continuation of a process that builds people up and not tear them down. And do you have opportunities now to go back into Chicago, your old neighborhoods, or other neighborhoods where there are young people, schools, yeah. or... Um, to mentor young people like you were, you know, and give them hope and give them opportunities. Are you doing that in Los Angeles or? So if you, if you read the book, you um, saw the chapter, Bro, you're from Evanston. Anybody see that one? <laughs> so with this particular chapter, I talk about a fight that Richard Fowler and I had on there. Anybody know Richard Fowler? Right, they like him. <laughs> So Richard Fowler is a Democrat on our network. He's one of my colleagues. But before he and I both got hired, we were always, and if you look at us on Tuesday nights with Shannon Breen, we're on, we're paired together quite a bit. But um, I tell a story in the book how Richard, when we first met, I just seen him on TV all the time. So before we met, I was excited about meeting him because I remember, although he's a Democrat, he was on the network all the time. So excited to be on and, and debate him. I'm in the green room and um, I hear his voice. I stand up there, uh, introduce myself. And he kind of gave me one of those looks like, who are you? I'm like, well, you know, it's a, I'm Gianno Caldwell. It's a pleasure to meet you. I'm excited to go on with you. And he kind of looked, like, looked at me and I wrote about it in the book so I can say, he looked at me a little bit like, uh, I, you know, I'm like I was beneath him a little bit. So, <laughs> I was shocked by that, fairly surprised. So I said, where are you from, Richard? And he says, I'm from Chicago. And I said, no kidding, where? Because obviously I'm from Chicago. And he says, Evanston. And I said, that isn't Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> so he said a word that I won't repeat, and he just walked off into the <laughs> I said, how dare you? Like, I, I was shocked. <laughs> So we, we went on there, and if y'all know Richard, y'all know he talks, and he'll run the clock out on you. He'll just try to talk over you. Well, I wasn't going to do that, so he, couldn't, he wasn't going to have that opportunity to do that with me. So I, um, I'm on air with him, and I'm interrupting him. What facts do you have to back that up? What facts do you have to back that up? And he says, I got them from the newspaper. Do you even read those? 
Word. Okay. The God <laughs> one has been dropped. <laughs> right. Then the clock went out. So after that, you knew I was going to be after him every time I was on air with him. So every time I'm on air with him, I got a joke I'm dropping on him. Just every time I'm hitting him with something. So then he calls me up one day and he says, um, hey, you know, let's stop doing this on air. Let's just, you get your point across, I get my point across, we let each other talk. And I tell him, well, you kicked it off, but okay, all right, well, we can do that. So three or four weeks later, we go on air together. Richard breaks all the rules. <laughs> he does the Richard Fowler thing. He talks, he runs out the clock. So I wait for him to come out. And interestingly enough, this, this is the part that really needs to be mentioned. I come out the booth because it's a remote location, you camera and you go in and do your thing. I get out into the, the news bureau and I have someone, a producer say, Gianno, you got a call. And I'm like, wait a second, I'm reaching for my phone. Like maybe I lost my phone. No, it was a producer from another show. I've never gotten a call. So I'm like, okay, I get on the phone and it's a producer and he says, hey, I just watched you on air with Richard. Never let him do that to you again. And I'm like, whoa, so now <laughs> the gloves are really about to come off now. So I wait for Richard to come out and I say, hey, what happened? I thought we made a deal. We were gonna, you know, let each other speak. He says, you know how it is, Gianna, ha, ha, ha. And I said, you know, I got you next time, right? <laughs> so I wait for him, wait for us to go back on air and I'm pushing him. Richard doesn't know what he's talking about. Richard just says things. He wouldn't respond because he knew what was coming. So then one Saturday, I just happened to know because Ed, I had dinner with Ed Henry, lunch with Ed Henry, and told me he was going to be hosting Fox and Friends weekend. This was before he became a permanent host. So I said, okay, I'm going to go on with, with you, Ed. So we set up the interview. And I'm going on, I'm thinking it's, it's a Chicago topic. I'm excited about it. This is my, my area of expertise. I go on air, and as I'm walking back, the guest greeter says to me, have you seen Richard? I said, wait, Richard's gonna be on? He's gonna be on this? She says, yes. I said, okay, I'm, in my mind, I'm producing the whole segment. I've been waiting for this moment for a long time. <laughs> so we get on air, I set the trap, <laughs> and I said, Richard, unlike Richard, I didn't read about the news in Chicago, I lived it, so I'm poking the bear. And then Richard does the Richard thing. Oh, what the home audience doesn't know is I'm from Chicago. I lived in Chicago, et cetera, et cetera. And I say, Richard, bruh, 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 you're from Evanston. <laughs> Went crazy viral. <laughs> and he was very embarrassed from there on out. But after that moment, to answer your question, after I told a very long story, I hope y'all enjoyed it. That's why we're here. <laughs> after that moment, and after people beat him up upside the head, I felt a little bad for Richard. Because, yeah, I know, I shouldn't have felt bad, but I did, I did. Uh, because I'm seeing on his Facebook page, even his grandmother seemed like she's like, bro, you're from Evanston. You know, Richard's watching right now. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure he is. <laughs> so I, I decide, I say, okay, let's make something at this moment. Let's go back to the city of Chicago where this has gone completely and totally viral. It went viral nationally. Let's go back and talk to the youth of Chicago who's experiencing very harsh violence, people who are hopeless, they're sad, they believe they can't make anything of themselves. I have a story to tell, Richard has a story to tell. Let's go back into these very environments in which I grew up and you know, Richard was in Evanston, but that's okay. <laughs> And let's You're tell not going to let story. that one go, are you? Right now, no. It's still a thing now. <laughs> let's tell our story. And what we ended up doing, I scheduled maybe five or six schools, high schools, elementary schools. And we went and talked to the youth of Chicago. It was me, Richard, and Ebony K. Williams, if y'all remember her from Fox News Channel. And we talked about our backstories. How did we get to where we are today? And some of those students I still mentor today. It's great. And it's incredibly humbling to have been able to go back to the city that I grew up in. We went to a high school that was a mere blocks from where I lived when I was um, in what, eighth grade, seventh, eighth grade, and tell these kids, no matter what you've gone through, no matter what you're going through right now, that there's no way and no challenge that can defeat you. There's absolutely no obstacle that can defeat you. It may not feel that way right now, but certainly with faith in yourself, uh, hopefully faith in God, you can defeat any obstacle and I'm living, breathing proof. Now I understand there's things, challenges that can come up. You can have parents that don't love you, who don't support you, but you can reach out to me and use me as someone mm -hmm. 
to speak a word of life into you. And I thought that was just, that was a moment that I'll never forget to be able to share that. Yeah, yeah. My guess is they didn't forget it either. So you probably will hear from some of them, which would be great. Yeah, I'm excited. I'm always excited to talk to new people, yeah. especially about their life goals. Well, we, um, one of the things that I loved about the book, and actually it answers the second question I think that he gets asked the most, how and why the heck did, are you a black conservative? Um, and I want to talk about it because he talks about a little in the book that um, a pivotal point in your personal growth was a lot of research that you did into the history of the Republican right. Party, the conservative movement versus the Democratic Party in terms of slavery, civil rights, morals, and traditional values. Can you tell us what you found? Give us a, just a little bit of a history lesson here and tell us how your findings affected you. So just a little bit. Just, I talked too long bit. on the last one, okay. <laughs> So this is what happened. Growing up in the city of Chicago and the neighborhoods in which I grew up in, I was taught that if you were a Republican, it didn't matter who you were, um, what your value system was, whatever. You were a racist, point blank period. That's what I was taught. People in my same community believe the same thing. From people I've talked to, family, friends, that was just what we were taught. So why would I believe anything differently? One particular day, I was having a conversation with an older African-American gentleman who was a Democrat, and I began to pontificate these same views. And he challenged me, and he told me that I didn't know the true history of the Republican Party. He says, didn't you know that all black folks were conservatives, they were Republicans? And I'm like, no, that's not true. He said, MLK was a Republican. I said, now you're really lying to me, so now I'm getting upset. And, after I get challenged in any situation, I go research so I can have a stronger argument because he was mentioning things that I clearly never heard before. And he wasn't looking to convert me to a Republican. And after I did some research, simply going to Google and putting, it, putting in differences between Democrats and Republicans and seeing that the Republican Party was started in 1854 in opposition to the Kansas-Nebraska Act, which wanted to expand slavery. Um, seeing that every civil rights bill that's ever been passed um, was either sponsored by a Republican or including LBJ's a civil rights bill was passed because of Republican supports. D Democrats in the Senate didn't want to support it. When I saw that MLK legitimately was a, a conservative, when I saw that um, small business Republicans cared about businesses, and my grandfather often talked about uh, overtaxation and regulation of his business would dry, drive him out of business, when I saw the conservative movement was a pro-faith movement, I said, wait a second, this is me. And I had to keep digging because it couldn't be me. How could I be one of these people who's you know, racist? How could I be <laughs> like, are you, that can't be right. So it sat with me longer. I continued to research more and more. And at, after I acquiesced to the fact that I was a conservative, months of depression ensued. <laughs> I, I seriously was depressed. I was, how could, no, I can't be. So after letting it sit with me for a while, um, I decided, you know, maybe I'll tell some folks that I was interested in, you know, really joining a conservative movement. And everyone that I told were like, what, how could you, how dare you, how could you? Don't you know those folks are racist? And I said, well, let me go back into this closet a little while longer. <laughs> and then I jumped out. And I had, not my auntie, <laughs> my lovely aunt, not her, but I had family members that disowned me completely and totally. They, they told me I lost it. Finally, I wanted to be white so badly that I decided to join the conservatives, <laughs> you know? Um, then friends fell off, and then my dating pool began to dry up. <laughs> uh, it, it was really rough. Uh, you know, the sisters were like, mm, no, nah, I'm not going, I'm sorry, I can't date you. And then that's when really things begin to change because how am I going to do this? How am I going to stick with my value system and, and be accepted? Like everyone wants to be accepted, everyone wants to be loved, right? And it was so difficult and it was so hard, but I ended up doing it and creating this vision for myself in some ways, maybe not that correct, maybe 
even Uncle Tom would be an accurate statement. Maybe I wanted to be around people who would accept me so much that I begin to do things that I shouldn't have. And at some point, it just all made sense. It clicked for me. Let me feel very strongly about my value system and just speak to people and let them know why I am the way I am and whether they accept me or not is their business. And it took a long time to get there. It really did. It took years to get there. And I still have these inner conflicts now where when there's issues that come up that may be of importance to the black community, where they may stand and where I may stand may be totally opposite. And is this something I'm gonna step out on? Do I feel comfortable enough to speak out on it or not? Like these are things that legitimately happen. So for those that watch me on air, you may see me take a position that you may not necessarily think I would take. Um, and it may not be in line with what everything maybe President Trump has said or conservatives in general. Because I feel, I feel the need to represent, first and foremost, I'm, I'm God's child. Number one, I'm a Christian. Number two, I'm an American. Number three, I am black and I happen to be a conservative. And I'm a representative of the black community even if some don't accept me that way. Mm -hmm. Maybe reject me. Uh, but at the same time, I have to speak my truth. And sometimes it's very, very difficult, especially when you're before millions of people and you got all these people shouting at you all the time from both sides. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's one of the strengths that I saw throughout the book was that you are willing to speak a truth and you're willing to take a stand and you're willing to be strong about it and not step back if somebody disagrees with you because you believe you can disagree with people, not Richard Fowler maybe, but, um, and be civil. Richard's gonna love this, we're making Richard famous right now. <laughs> well, that you can, you can disagree with people and be civil about yes, it. Yes, absolutely. And that's, that's you know, something that, you know, the man whose name is on this library has felt very strongly about and something I hope, and I know everybody in this room hopes that we can get back to that on how we, you know, govern and right. lead the society in this country is, is that civility um, that you're hoping for. Absolutely, and it, it's, it's become very difficult now. Yeah. And it's so unfortunate that it's so one-sided. You may have a bunch of Trump supporters in this room, obviously there's a lot of conservatives here, but you should be able to give your opinion, whether it be on social media or talk to a friend, and them not say, oh wow, so you support President Trump, we're no longer friends, let me unfollow you, unfriend you, or I'm gonna talk bad about you. We don't really do that with Democrats, do we? We don't really, we don't really do that. We may say like, oh, I disagree with his opinion, but he has a right to it. You're an American, you have free speech. And I think we need to really get back to that part where we can have civil conversations and you can be a full-on conservative, you can be a full-on liberal, and we can re have respectful dialogue. And that's what I'm hoping for. Yeah. Well, you talked about your values, and I know one of them is your faith, Jono. And Huge in, part. In the book you write, all of us have been constrained in one way or another, limited by societal expectations, by our own families, by words, limited by where we get our ideas, and whom we'll work with to solve the big problems and achieve grand dreams, limited by our own self-doubt. But when I first started following fundamental conservative values, it ended all of that for me. It destroyed all such limitations by giving me faith in God, faith in the process, and ultimately faith in myself. Faith is very important to you as it is to many in this audience. I don't usually ask our distinguished guests to talk about their love lives. However, I'm gonna break that rule tonight because I received a phone call yesterday afternoon from Giano who really wanted to tell a story about faith. And yes, it involves one of his girlfriends, but I need to remind him that this is a family-based audience. <laughs> Be very, very careful. Um, but it is a wonderful story. It's in the book, and I would love for you to share it. So interestingly enough, I've never actually publicly discussed this. It's in the book, but it's never come up in interviews, and I've done a lot of them around the book. Some years ago, um, I was dating a, a, a young lady, and 
I know we're believe, we got a lot of believers in here, and I believe in the voice of God, and I believe in hearing from God. I know some people don't believe in that, but I strongly believe in that. I was seeing a young lady who, um, in the very beginning, I know God told me, be a friend to her, help her, but don't get romantically involved with her. And I ended up getting romantically involved with her. We're seeing each other, we're spending time, and we dated for a number of years. And things begin to feel unsettled and off. And I couldn't figure out why, what was going on? Was this a young lady that just simply had been cheating on me? What was going on? I couldn't figure it out. So one day, I um, got a hold of her iPhone and I hacked her iPhone. I'm sure y'all, like, how did you hack an iPhone? Well, I was able to download her iPhone onto my laptop. And <laughs> I'm, a trust, I'm a trusting guy. <laughs> So I don't think God told you to do that. Right, no, no. <laughs> well, the door was open, I walked in. <laughs> we here. <laughs> so, so I downloaded her phone onto my, uh, my laptop. And it, if, if y'all know how that process works, sometimes it takes hours to do it. But if you want to upload the phone, it takes even more hours. So it's like such a long process, it may not be worth the time. So I did this. Two weeks later, I happened to be out of town. I was in Chicago. So I had some time on my hands, and I wanted to see what was going on. I go through this process, and I began to read her messages. And the first message that I saw was between her and one of her dear friends, and she, she said she felt so badly for how she was doing me. She said I was a great guy and sweet and all these other good quality things. I still am. Um, <laughs> Then everything became clear as she was talking to her friend. The woman that I had fallen in love with wasn't simply just cheating on me. She was selling her time and affection for men for extraordinary amounts of money. So that situation, I mean, it really, it hurt. It hurt, it made me feel like I was locked in a cage. I introduced this young lady to family and friends. And I became completely and totally untrusting of people, specifically women that I were dating. I became a victim. I truly did. And it took a number of years to really get beyond that and really having those conversations with God in therapy to really be able to build back that kind of trust. But that kind of situation, I think so many people experience things that provide shame for them. And I tried to put this, I put this in a book and the publisher tried to take it out like five times because they're like, we don't want to do that. Like this is a conservative book. We want to make sure we don't put anything like that. We don't want to disrupt the message. But I thought it was so important to put it in there because there's so many of us, everyone in this room has experienced something that provided a level of shame to them. Something that they would never want to mention to somebody else. Something that if somebody talked about it or, or reported on it would feel completely and totally hurt and feel like, wow, how am I gonna live again? And that's how I felt. Like, who would ever want me after being in a situation like that? And I wanna let you know, as a, someone who's experienced something that was a huge heartbreak for me, there's absolutely room to build. There's absolutely room to live again. There's absolutely room to build beyond any shame that you might currently be experiencing. There's a God who treats us like we've never done anything wrong. And I think that's one of the things that I love so much about a God that I serve, who no matter what I've done ever, will take me in and treat me like I've never committed any wrongs whatsoever. Will give me a life. Please, please, please. That will give me a life that you can look at me now today, like I dressed up, got a haircut, and you would never know the life in which I experienced in my past, in my, my childhood, any of those things, because I'm not a perfect person by no measure, and I don't want people to walk away with that, that fallacy. <laughs> but certainly that was a situation I think that helped mold my thinking around a lot of issues. Uh, well, I, I do think he, he puts obstacles in your way all along your life. We're all a work in progress. Even when you get to be my age, you know, you, you can always learn something more. And sometimes it's a little harder than you'd like it to be, the lesson. Um, but you're very young, Gianno, so right. I think... <laughs> Hopefully never I, I a think, situation like that again. No, I hope you don't either. <laughs> but um, I, I appreciate 
uh, the situation, and I, and I, for one, appreciate that you put it in the book, because I think you're right. Everybody does have something that's in their life that they've been ashamed of, that's been embarrassing. Um, and as long as you turn it into something positive, which I think right. you have, I think that's what's important. Right, and I, I don't personally believe God puts obstacles in our path. I believe there's obstacles that are placed in our path that he helps us get, get around, up. overtake, and have a lesson and a testimony for someone else. Yeah, yeah. I love this crowd. I know, it's a good crowd. <laughs> we, have, we have great people, and they've um, submitted a few questions. If we have time, we might be able to go to a question in the audience. But I have one here. Um, you have a new documentary on Fox Nation. Correct. Called The New Battle for Chicago. It's advertised as gritty and an inside look at gang life in your hometown. Right. What can you tell us about it? And are you going to do more of this? Yeah. So this documentary, The New Battle for Chicago, if y'all don't have Fox Nation, which I'm sure a lot of you do, go and subscribe. It's, it's a free trial for, I think, seven days or a week. And you can check out the documentary. I went back to my hometown and I met with a lot of people who are enduring the violence. What a lot of people have seen me talk about on air is during Memorial Day weekend 2017, one of my younger brothers was in a car with two of his friends when two men walked up and shot the car 25 times. My little brother lived, thankfully, and we praise God for that every day, but his best friend died in his arms. So after having that experience, the issue of violence in Chicago had become something that I already cared about, but it became a real passion because we're talking about my family's being impacted, friends, friends of friends. It's almost hard to find someone in the city of Chicago that hasn't experienced the violence in some way, shape or form. So I went back to the city of Chicago, took a crew, and I met with law enforcement, uh, teachers, I met with folks who were victims of the violence, and I also met with the perpetrators. I met with the gang members, the ones who were actively involved in it. And they were willing to talk to me, and in some cases, they even showed me their guns. These guys had AK-47s, all kind of weapons. And my question to them was, why? And mostly, I was told, and this one particular trip, I left feeling so depressed and so sad, it was insane. They said that there's no hope for us. There's always gonna be murders in the city of Chicago. They felt that there was no opportunity. And they often pointed to their childhood and how they grew up and I would respond, hey, I grew up very similar to you guys. Because they thought like, oh no, you, you know, you're one of the special types. And that's why when we talk about being exceptional and people call me exceptional all the time and I reject that narrative because I believe we all have this hidden ability within us, we just happen to call it potential. We are all, quote unquote, exceptional. It just takes some tapping into to, to pull it out. So as I had these conversations with these, these individuals, I ran across a, a, a young man by the name of Little Greg, and if y'all saw, we did a town hall special on Laura Ingram's show, we did a couple of those. Y'all familiar with Little Greg? Anybody familiar with Little Greg, the story of Little Greg? So Lil Greg was um, a young man that I interviewed and I said to him on air, if I were to get you a job, would you get out of the life of gangs, violence, and drugs? And he said, yes. So that very night, I reached out to some friends and coordinated a job for him. Well, what was interesting on that, it wasn't just that he asked him once. He said, are you sure? Mm -hmm. and the kid said, yeah, I think so. And he said, no, no, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm going to get you a job. Will you show up at the job? Are you sure? Yes. And he said, yeah, I, I, I'm pretty sure. And he said, okay, I'm getting you a job. Right. And went to work to get him one. Um, so then after I procured one for him, he said, oh, I'm, not, I'm working in a program right now. I can't, I can't go in just yet. After the program, I'm going to take the job. I said, okay. I kept in touch with him. He had my cell number. He would call me, text me. We stayed in touch. I hadn't heard from him in a little bit, so I said, let me reach out to Lil Greg and see what's going on. So I text him, no response. So I wait, call him. His phone's not working. And you know how young people, they change phones all the time now, change phone numbers. So then I began to pull out feelers in the neighborhood. Anyone, you know, have you, you know Lil Greg? Have you heard, you heard from him, et cetera, anything? No one really knew him. And then an old friend of mine from, what, seventh grade, 
um, I ran into him and I said, hey, do you know a guy named Little Greg who was in this, in this area, this community that I went to school? He was like, oh yeah, I know Little Greg. He said, he was, um, he was killed. I said, what? I said, no, we can't be talking about the same person. No, absolutely not. This can't be the same person. Turns out, and there was reporting on it, little Greg was shot by two men who, he was just going into a, a store, coming out, and these two men went up to him and shot him in cold blood. And it was, it was really heartbreaking for me. You know, when you, you find somebody who's willing to, to step out of their life and make something of themselves, or at least say they want to, and little Greg seemingly had so much potential and I was just so heartbroken by it. The, the, the violence in the city of Chicago continues to snuff people out. Now, it's not all bad in Chicago, and I don't want anybody to walk away with that impression. There's a lot of good quality people in Chicago. There's people that's working to stop the violence in Chicago. There's people who are offering jobs to folks that are getting out of jail in Chicago. But there's still too much crime and violence in the city of Chicago. And that's why I'm so thankful to Fox News Channel for continuing to give me the platform to raise awareness around the issues of the violence in Chicago. So hopefully we can get some solutions and things will be better. Because I'm sure everyone in this room has someone that lives in Chicago or close or they know someone. We want people to live and we want people to be able to live full lives. So that's been the work that I've been doing with Fox Nation. And you can check out the new battle for Chicago on Fox Nation. I, I would love it if you did, please. It's great. We have a few minutes left. Um, I have a, a number of questions. One is from somebody in the audience. Lakers or Clippers? <laughs> uh, actually, I live down the street from Staples Center. So whoever has tickets, because... <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that's the answer of a politician. Don't tell me you're not running for office one of these days. Um, Can we do one from the audience? Yeah. I, would I would love I to hear from somebody say, in the audience. Okay, if you have a question, please raise your hand, but wait for a microphone because we are live streaming. So let's go right here in the center aisle. Deanna's coming right there with the microphone. I'm sure y'all gonna be nice. <laughs> Looking at me, you know better than that. <laughs> Okay, so um, I do a lot of historical talks on black history. I'm so glad what you were saying, but also, what, and I've been doing this several years, also what we started now is a school choice initiative because, especially with black boys, 43% of them not graduating high school, 40% can't read above the fourth grade level, 9% of them are not proficient in science, and these same kids are going to be one that ended up on drugs or on the street. So um, this is something we're working with right now with a lot of people, parents and school uh, uh, people that are coming in. We just did a big town hall at Reverend uh, Price's church in LA. And so the minimum starting to, to be able to get this on the initiative because we're losing too many of our black kids, uh, just whole generations just being wiped out, even here in, uh, in California. So I like your story, what you had to say. Now, what could you say, because uh, you said you've been working with this for a while. And I'm just really confused uh, when I see you and other people too. I know you don't have a lot of sway in that. But the thing about it is that these politicians have been in, in these fields forever. For 50 years it's been going on, where God, the church, and family all work together as far as to make build this. But why are we still losing 8,000 kids a year? Now, I don't know about this current administration. I think he's done a lot. But the previous administration, he was from Chicago. Right. How can you lose five to 600 kids a year in these environments? Do we even have the kind of black kids left? Now, me, if I was running, Things are just like, listen, we doing shut, we shutting this stuff down right now. You ain't gonna have a pot to piss in or win them throughout of. We got it's an it's a war zone and we have to treat it as such. But I wonder with all your connections, how come it's not being treated like a war zone? Because we could stop this violence if we wanted to, go into these communities. We just got to do what we have to do to get it done. Why is that not getting done still on that level? Okay. And have you spoken to anybody about that? Okay, so um, you, you pretty much asked two questions. One was school choice and one was about the violence in places like the city of Chicago. So one, I support school choice, and hopefully most folks here do as well. Um, I support charter schools. If you look at just purely the numbers, 60% of those that attend charter schools are African American or minority. Uh, about 50% of those who attend charter schools are poor. 
uh, the, the school system, especially with public schools, a lot of teachers, there are some good teachers there, don't, don't get me wrong, but the bad ones aren't being able to be held accountable because of the school unions. So we need choice. We absolutely need choice. And I appreciate President Trump on this issue. If you saw the State of the Union, um, where he gave the young, young lady, the nine-year-old black girl, a scholarship for school choice, I thought that was amazing. I thought that was amazing. And there needs to be more options when it comes, when it comes to school. And so I support that 100%. And I think from, the, from a conservative perspective, that's a, a narrative and agenda that's continuing to be pushed. So I'm thankful for that. The second thing in terms of the violence in places like Chicago, I interviewed by a guy by the name of um, State Representative LaShawn Ford, who, and I believe it was 2006, I think it was, he, they had a press conference because the violence was pretty bad at that time, and he requested that the National Guard come in. Um, it was him and another, these are Democrats actually. It was him, he's an African American Democrat and a, a white Democrat, they requested that the National Guard come in because they thought it was that bad. I had an opportunity to interview him a couple years back, and I said, do you think it's time to bring the National Guard in um, right now? And he said, potentially, yes. Um, he also said that he thought that it was time for us to start working with the Trump administration, President Trump, on this issue. If y'all recall, President Trump said in a tweet, if Chicago doesn't fix this carnage, I'll send the feds. Uh, another debate Richard and I had a debate on. <laughs> Uh, and it was factually inaccurate, uh, Richard was. But anyway, um, I think in terms of your question, yes, I've talked to the Trump administration. Uh, they've asked me to bring people to the table to talk about the issue. And now with the Opportunity Zones, they're using that particular funding, that private investment to help with the violence. But the mayor of the city of Chicago, the current one and the former one, is refusing to work with the administration on this issue. That's problematic. Like, you can't bring politics into this issue. Why would you? You're talking about people who are dying. My little brother could have died. He legitimately could have died. And you're talking about you don't want to work with the Trump administration because you don't like his politics? Absolutely not. How dare you? And that's the problem I see with so many individuals on the left. It seems like the politics, them winning a, a political argument or whether it be impeachment or Russia or whatever it is, is much more important than governing. And that's where they're losing because we can't put, people's lives are legitimately at stake and you need to not necessarily focus on the politics, but making the lives of individuals, taxpayers, voters better. Mm -hmm. And that's where a lot of folks, especially on the left, are losing that fight. Yeah, thank you for that. I think we have a, we'll take one over here. Right there, yes. sir. Wait, wait for the, the microphone is right, right to here. your left, sir. There we go. Thank you for coming tonight. Thank you for having me. We are here tonight because of your impressive performance last weekend with Governor Huckabee. Oh, wow. Thank show. you. Thank you. During that interview, you talked about the black vote this year. Yes. Whether it be 20% blacks, 30% blacks, the governor asked you a question, why do you think this is? And you had a great answer. Your answer was because he's proving that what he said he would do, he is doing right now. Right. I read, and maybe it was fake news, <laughs> I read that you have said, I have supported Donald Trump, but I don't always agree with the way he handles things. Mm -hmm. You want to expand on that a little bit? Sure, and, and I'll hit two points here. One, President Trump, the Trump administration has done tremendous work when it comes to black issues. Specifically, the First Step Act, we're talking about thousands of people released from jail, nonviolent offenders, 90% of them have been black. Which, by the way, is in the book, and it's a fascinating account um, that I really commend you to read because Gianno tells it like it is. And, you know, every member of Congress in Washington, D.C. needs to read that chapter and see themselves in it. <laughs> right, right. And I worked on that issue in D.C. I went, literally flew out to Washington, D.C. Candace Owens gave me a call. And I had been working on criminal justice issues for quite a while. And we went out and lobbied this issue on Capitol Hill, the First Step Act specifically. Opportunity zones, 1.3 million uh, uh, investment, private investment into communities, 1.3 million black families being impacted, the lowest black unemployment rate on record. Um, we can talk on and on, jail reform, we can go on and on, 
I've personally, personally in my lifetime, and let's say I'm only 33, so double it, 60 years, 80 years, 90 years, 100 years, I've never seen a president, regardless if he said some things I may not agree with, or even insensitive, I've never seen a, per a president that's been so focused on issues of impact in the black community. Democrats have, in my view, failed the African-American community. You, African-Americans have voted for them 95% of the time, 90 plus percent. They come in with a song and dance every election year, nothing changes, nothing gets better, and then expect for black folks to vote for them again. I think that's changing, and to the point that you mentioned, that I mentioned on Governor Huckleby um, show, because President Trump actually has a list of accomplishments. In three years, can you believe, in three years? Like we've never, said, President Obama didn't do it. In three years, he's done all these things, and I, I, I applaud him for doing that. Um, to that next point that you, that you mentioned, and also the approval rating for President Trump has doubled in the black community. To the next point, I think, hmm. Give me, the, give me, give me that last piece of your question again. Say it again, sir. I want to make sure that I, I accurately respond. Just say it. Oh yeah, that point, right. No, 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 no. I, the policies are cool. They're okay. That's not the point. The point is, and I, and I mentioned that, some things he may tweet or say I may not always agree with, and I go on there and I say I, don't dis I disagree with it, here's why, to answer your question. Okay, we're going to take one more from the audience. We'll take it right here. Wait for the microphone. Dan is coming. Thank you. I'm loving hearing you. Thank you. Um, we can do what the federal government can do, the state government can do, legislature, but where do we turn the focus on what the black community needs to do for themselves? That's a great question. And That's I'm talking really about question. parenting, um, maybe even send in parent classes, but when their own parents are just on drugs or on welfare, I'm not, sh I think that's a huge component of this revolving door of unsuccessful lifestyles. So I want to first say that I don't want anybody to walk away with any impression that this happens everywhere. This isn't widespread in the sense that there's a lot of good black parents. There's a lot of successful African-American parents who are doing their job. They're working every day. They're working very hard. They're, they're teaching their kids really good, strong values. That unequivocally, I want to make sure people realize that. There are some who've failed the test, but that happens in all communities. Um, and when it comes to this accountability piece, and I, I really appreciate that question because there's a lot of times when I say things on air, because you, everybody knows Fox News Channel is the most watched network in the country, um, but it's not a lot, as many African Americans watching as there may be white Americans. So a lot of times when I address these issues that happen within the black community, I'll get uh, pushback from folks within the black community on things that we may talk about privately. We may have these conversations privately, but don't you dare go say it on Fox News. <laughs> It is, it's this idea that we got to protect the community, which is okay, but we got to speak truth. How do things ever change if you don't talk about it? And I think there is a need to hold, for parents to hold themselves accountable and for people to speak up on those issues. Um, I think back to the, and I, I count this the democratic policies, I think back to the 1960s when the single mother rate in the black community was around 25%. Now it's 80%. Like, 80%? I think back to the fact that, and Democrats really need to be held accountable for a lot of this stuff. You, talk, you think about the 94 crime bill, which was pushed by Joe Biden. You think about the 86 crack laws pushed by Joe Biden, which took a lot of fathers out of the homes. These are problematic policies, again, pushed by the left. The fact that they support abortion as they do, a literally, Planned Parenthood was started, Margaret Sanger, for everybody that knows, literally to abort black lives. That was the whole point of it. There needs to be some real talk regarding these issues, and I think it's going to take people to really speak up and say it. 
And at this point, you don't have as many folks speaking up, but I believe that there's a new generation of people who are willing to say these things. And I would like to say that I'm a part of that new generation. Okay, we are already over our time. However, I've been asking you a lot of questions tonight. You've gotten some from the audience, um, but I'm gonna turn the tables just a little bit now. Uh -oh. And ask you, if you could ask yourself one question at this point in your life and career, what would it be? That's an excellent question. Oh, good, thank you. You're good at this. <laughs> <laughs> what would I ask myself? Jesus Christ. <laughs> I don't like to use the Lord's name in vain. Um, what would I ask? I think the... Okay, let me turn the tables on you. <laughs> oh, no, no, this is about you, Gianno. <laughs> I know, I was gonna make it about me. People say I'm actually good at that, making it about me. That's not true. Uh, so this is, what I would, this is what I would say to myself, and this is something I constantly say to myself. Never fear. If y'all see when I, I sign your books, I put in 2 Timothy 1 and 7. I, gotta, I have to keep going back to that because it's so important. There's decisions that I, 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 I've made in life previously where I did it out of fear. And when you operate out of fear, it usually leads to chaos, my view. Because there will be, say for example, there's an opportunity that you that you believe, a business you want to start, um, an opportunity you want to take, but you're constantly reminding yourself that you may not be as qualified as the next person or, um, you know, no one's going to give me this opportunity or I can't start this business because who's going to buy it, etc. Like those things happen, right? We, people question themselves on that quite a bit. But honestly speaking, and this is from a faith perspective, if, if you can do it, then it's not, you need to do something that's too big for you to do because you do it in partnership with God. Like, I want to take on opportunities that are so big and expansive that I can't do it on my own without God's help. So I would say to myself, never fear. And I'm constantly reminding myself of that right now. Like I'm always speaking that scripture because when there's something that's coming up, it should be so big for me that I can't do it. I'll remind you of something that's in the book. I was meeting with our former CEO, Jack Abernathy, the CEO of Fox News Channel. It was a big deal because even on-air talent don't really get meetings with the CEO of Fox News Channel. And I'm meeting with him, and he um, says to me, what's your five-year plan? And I, I sat back in the chair because I'm thinking, am I going to say what I'm really thinking, or am I going to give him, you know, and I just chose to be authentic Gianno Caldwell, or as President Trump calls me, Gianni. <laughs> well, I said that. That's, that's my birth name, actually. Gianni is my birth name. So he got it right. Um, I said, you know what? I said, I don't have a five-year plan. And he says, what? How is it you don't have a five-year plan? Like, what professional doesn't have a five-year plan? And I said, what I believe is possible for me today, God can do in five years. What I believe is possible for me today in five years, God can do for me in a month, or a day, or a week. So I don't make five-year plans. I set goals in partnership with God, and I meet them and exceed them. And I think that's incredibly important. So to myself, don't fear, and just trust God. I think that's a good one. Thank you, Gianno, Thank you. for being here. Thank all of you for joining us. I hope you will come uh, middle of March. We have the former White House correspondent for U.S. News and World Report, Ken Walsh, coming. Um, and then we have Charlie Kirk at the end of the month. So hopefully we'll see all of you there. Now, before you leave, though, Gianno has agreed to go up to the store and sign books. He's personalizing. So we will meet you up there in a few minutes. If you let us go, um, we'll go one way, you'll go the other, and we too shall meet upstairs. So thank you all for coming. Thank y'all. I look forward to meeting y'all. Yep.